everyone. Welcome to the sixth program in our 2020 Sawtooth Forum and Lecture Series. Alpine Epics brought to you by the Sawtooth Interpretive and Historical Association. My name is Laura Fitzgerald and I am one of the naturalists at the Redfish Center and Gallery. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that here in Stanley we are located in the ancestral homeland of the Duca Deca Band of the Shoshone Bannock Tribes. Thank you for joining us this evening. This program is free of charge thanks to our primary sponsors, Redfish Lake Lodge and the McNoll family in memory of the Roland McNoll, who is an avid series attendee and a steward of the Sawtooth. We thank you and for your continued support. As many of you know, the association is a member-based nonprofit. Our mission is to protect and advance the natural and cultural history of Idaho's Sawtooth Salmon River country through preservation and education. Our operations are funded by donations, grants, memberships, and book and map sales at our book bookstores, located inside 11 ranger stations, as well as the Redfish Visitor Center and Gallery, uh, and here at the Stanley Museum. We hope you will consider supporting this series by making a donation tonight in our Sawtooth Bowl, over at our stand over here. Use your credit card with our D uh, dip jar, or by becoming a member under the tent to your uh, left over here. Would any of our current members of Seahaw please raise your hands? Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for your support. If you have any questions about our memberships or anything else, find someone in a blue shirt after the programs and they will be happy to help you. I'm very excited to introduce Jesse Logan this evening. Dr. Logan is a recognized authority on high elevation white bark pine forests of the Rocky Mountains. After a career at Colorado State University, Virginia Tech, and the Rocky Mountain Research Station, he continues to advocate for the high elevation forests of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In summer, he works for Yellowstone Forever, leading field seminars that range from fly fishing to high mountain ecology. And in winter, he works as a backcountry ski guide for Quick City-based Yellowstone ski tours. He recently served as associate editor and contributing map editor for the acclaimed Voices of Yellowstone Capstone, a narrative atlas of the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness. Tonight, Dr. Logan will present Ghost Forests of the White Cloud Mountains, a harbinger of, climate, of changing climate, describing the collapse of white bark pine com communities and possible future scenarios. Please welcome Jesse Logan. Thanks a lot for that uh, nice introduction. And uh, for anyone who happens to be interested, I do have some copies of Yellowstone's <laughs> capstone. <laughs> so I would be happy to uh, sign and uh, offer them for sale. All the proceeds from this book go to support the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness Foundation. And we were able to raise all funds to pay for production of the book uh, from donors, so it's all gravy for the foundation. So it's been a really worthwhile project, a lot of fun to work on. But uh, what I'm really here to talk about is really the time spent here in the Sawtooth Valley or surrounding area. And, uh, you know, I put about 15 years working for the Forest Service somewhere in this area and have a lot of really fond memories of Stanley in this area. And my wife Catherine over here, as a kid, uh, spent summers uh, with her family camping for a couple of weeks uh, each summer up at Redfish Lake. So, you know, it's, it's a nostalgic trip uh, for both of us. And when Ed Kennedy asked me if I'd be interested in making a presentation this year at the museum, I jumped at the chance. So, uh, you know, we're pleased to be here. Um, my, uh, I'd, I'd also like to know just how many uh, people here uh, this evening are local residents? And I, are, are there any tourists? <laughs> well, they're all good. I'll, uh, it, it, yeah, yay. <laughs> my, uh, I, you know, it might influence uh, a little bit what 
what I talk about, I don't think for any residents I have to explain just how important and how cool white bark pine are. But I'll, uh, I'll delve into that a little bit because they're really a truly remarkable forest. And the, uh, the story I'm going to tell today has uh, three chapters or maybe uh, three parts. Uh, first of all, the mountain pine beetle. It's a very small uh, insect that would easily fit on the tip of your little finger. Uh, the second uh, part is white bark pine, and as I say, the uh, white bark pine forests are truly magic, and uh, it's worth the effort uh, to hike up into them because, you know, to me, they're the most amazing forests I've ever, uh, you know, had the pleasure of being uh, spending time in, and that's growing up in southern Colorado with uh, the magnificent Ponderosa forest down there. And the uh, and the you know these massive clones of aspen, but the white bark are just just magic. And the third part of this story uh, is climate change, and that's a catastrophe of our own making. And uh, so those are the three parts I'm going to talk about today. As I said, my association with white bark in this area, or with white bark period, really goes back uh, about. Uh, well, 30 years ago, really, uh, and I'll talk more about that. But my association with the mountain pine beetle goes back quite a bit further. I hate to admit it, like 50 years. Uh, back to uh, 1971, the year that I was discharged from the Army. And before I, had, uh, before I was drafted, I had finished a master's degree in forest entomology, and I was also interested in mathematics and mathematical modeling. This was kind of the early days of uh, digital uh, ecology, you might say. And the person uh, who seemed to be doing the uh, best work at that time was a guy by the name of Ali Alan Berryman up at Washington State University. So during the time I was in the Army, I applied uh, to do a PhD under Allen, and it ends up I, I went to Washington State. And uh, as I you know, said, the, the main reason I was interested in working with Allen was because of the mathematics and the uh, mathematical modeling, but he also happened to be one of the foremost authorities in the world on this insect, the mountain pine beetle. And the mountain pine beetle is really important for those of uh, for economic reasons, it's the, the most important forest pest uh, in North America. So as it turns out, I didn't uh, actually end up working on the mountain pine beetle uh, for my PhD, but I, I did have that contact. And at the time I finished up uh, in 1976, there's a uh, annual meeting of a forest entomologist called the Western Forest Insect Workshop, and that year it happened to be in Wemmie, Oregon. And back then, every uh, they would take a break in the middle of these uh, quote scientific meetings uh, for a day of recreation and socializing. And typically at that time they held them at ski areas, so it was at, at Mount Hood. And uh, at that time I wasn't a skier. But I found myself sitting in the bar next to a guy by the name of Gene Ammon. And I knew of Gene's work from my interest in mountain pine beetle. He was perhaps the leading ecological authority of the time on mountain pine beetle. And here I'm sitting next to him at the bar, you know, just finishing up a PhD. And I said, wow, Dr. Ammon, you know, and I sort of, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate your work. And, you know, I was kind of in awe. And he uh, asked me who I was, and I told him. And he said, well, yeah, I kind of like your work, too. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, finished, uh, published a paper for my PhD work on the relationship between temperature and insect. And Gene said, you know, I have uh, this data set on the mountain pine beetle, and temperature is really important to precipitate the outbreak of this uh, insect. Would you, do you think you could... Uh, would be interested in working on this with me. And of course I was. Uh, I might uh, point out for those of you who aren't familiar with a mountain pine beetle, this, this little beetle, as I say, fits on the tip of your finger, can kill essentially an entire forest. It's, uh, it's 
a pretty remarkable uh, interaction, and I'll talk more about that. But uh, at any rate, uh, I went on to various other uh, jobs at, uh, mentioned at Colorado State University, and working with Gene on mountain pine beetle and modeling the relationship of mountain pine beetle to temperature was never the, uh, the, the primary uh, responsibility I had, but it was always my favorite, you know. The chance to be out in a uh, forest with mountain pine beetle uh, was really, uh, you know, and get paid for it, you know. You, that's hardly, hardly what you consider uh, work or a burden. Uh, it was a really interesting interaction. And the mountain pine beetle, this, this small insect, as I say, can kill entire forest, is, uh, uh, is the most um, uh, economically important. It's a native insect, so it also has uh, an important ecological role to play in uh, forests uh, of the western United States. It's, a, it's uh, capable of attacking and killing uh, essentially all pines. And, uh, it's the case of a small, weak predator killing a large, dangerous prey. The uh, beetle has to actually kill the tree before it can successfully reproduce. And the tree is not just a, a sitting duck, you know. They have evolved, co-evolved over the years, uh, substantive uh, chemical defenses in their resin to uh, essentially uh, kill or by just the very uh, amount of resin pitch out these attacking beetles. So it's a, it's a binary game. Either the beetle wins and kills the tree or the tree wins and pitches out the beetles. And uh, the beetles overcome these tree defenses by mass simultaneous emergence of the adult attacking beetles. And this is really important because literally thousands of beetles have to attack a tree at the same time to overcome these tree defenses. And uh, if they're successful, then the tree dies essentially from the roots up. The beetle, the attacking beetle, uh, bores into the tree, lays eggs, the larvae feed in the phloem tissue, and essentially girdle the tree. And uh, the phloem carries the nutrients produced, the, the carbohydrates produced in the needles down to the roots. Uh, so the roots essentially are not, you know, receiving any uh, nutrition from the photosynthate. Uh, but the needles are fine because the xylem tissue is essentially unaffected. So the tree dies from the roots up. And it takes a while, you know, as I say, this interaction, you know, the binary interaction, either the beetle wins or the tree wins, occurs in a matter of days, if not hours. But it takes quite some time for the tree to start to show the effect because, as I say, the needles are still uh, happy for a while. And, uh, but by the, uh, the attack occurs in late summer, early fall, by the following spring, trees that have been successfully attacked start to turn this really brilliant red. And they, they turn orange, and then by the end of the following summer, they're, uh, as I say, this really brilliant red. And uh, it's not cryptic at all on the landscape. You look at a uh, forest that's in this red uh, phase, and it, it's just shocking. You say, wow, there's something really important uh, and scary going on there. So, uh, the I'm pretty good at just rambling on, but I'd like to have some cheater notes with me just in case. Uh, so I've been working uh, with Gene off and on for, uh, you know, since I, I went to work at Colorado State University in the mid-70s. Until sometime, I think it was 86 or 87, Gene had a technician that had been working on his project that was interested in doing a PhD, uh, Barbara Bentz. And uh, so Barbara uh, and decided that, uh, you know, she would like to do a PhD under my direction and came to uh, 
Fort Collins to work with me. And since she was being her uh, paid for by Jean's project, of course she was working with Mountain Pine Beetle. And her project uh, really was starting to put together all this work I had been doing with Jean on the temperature response of the Mountain Pine Beetle to a working model that would carry it through the complete life stage of the beetle. And uh, just shortly after Barbara, who was from Texas, and one of the main reasons she wanted to work with me, I think, was to have a chance to come to Colorado, I got a good offer from uh, Virginia Tech. And Virginia Tech, uh, the offer came about kind of in the same way. Uh, fortuitously, I had met Jean at a Western Forest Ant Work Conference. Uh, at the uh, at the work conference in um, I don't know is it maybe 80 uh, 87 probably was uh, in at, at Snowbird in Utah and I happened to find myself sitting on a chairlift next to uh, Tom Payne who had just been appointed the uh, head of the department at Virginia Tech and he said I've, we you know we have this uh, position for uh, someone who can do insect modeling but is really interested in artificial intelligence. You think you'd be interested in applying for the job? And I thought, well, I don't know anything about artificial intelligence, but I'll, you know, I can fake it. So I applied and when I uh, interviewed for the job in Blacksburg at Virginia Tech, I found out the other person uh, who was uh, applying for the job really did know something about artificial intelligence. I figured, well, there's no chance they'll hire me for this, but I was able to convince the uh, forestry department there that, you know, if the two departments went together, they could put together a position. So the offer was made to go from 100% soft money at Colorado State to a fully funded position at Virginia Tech, and I jumped at it. Uh, wound up in Blacksburg, again, not working on the mountain pine beetle, full-time, but I had Barbara with me, and through that connection was still connected with the mountain pine beetle. And I also uh, had the opportunity to work with a friend of mine from uh, Canadian Forest Service, Jacques Rainier, on perfecting the ability to take these point temperature models to a large landscape, and that becomes really important. So uh, Barbara finished up, came back, uh, to Jean's project, and at that time, those of you who are from this area and were here know that there was a, a pretty major outbreak occurring in the Sawtooth Valley at the time in lodgepole pine. So uh, the forests here, uh, again, for uh, those of you who might not be familiar, in the valley floor uh, and up uh, uh, tend to be lodgepole uh, pine essentially a monoculture. Then as you get to mid-elevation, you get into spruce fir, and finally at the highest elevations in the most rugged habitat are these beautiful white bark pine forests. So things were happening in the valley here in lodgepole pine. Uh, Barbara was working on the project coming up to the Stanley area uh, to, to do the validation of the model we had developed together. So she was uh, measuring what was going on in the field, looking at the predictions of the model, and seeing if they matched up to what was occurring on the ground here in Lodgepole Pine. Uh, at about, uh, well, in 1992, uh, you know, that job at Virginia Tech was uh, the best job I'd ever have, and I knew it at the time, but I could not adjust not to looking out and seeing mountains. Having grown up in southern Colorado and spent really all my life uh, in the interior west, as uh, interesting and culturally significant as the Appalachians are, they're not the Rockies. So uh, in 92, uh, Jean was retiring from the Forest Service. The offer was made to step into that position as project leader, uh, and I jumped at it. Once again, winding uh, back up in the west in uh, Logan, Utah at the Forestry Sciences Lab there. And Gene, since you know, I was mid-career coming in from a, a really very different uh, culture into the Forest Service, uh, 
Jean stuck on as project leader on the project for a few months to try and ease that rather uh, rocky transition. And uh, there was, uh, at that time, a woman who is still in the valley here, uh, Dana Perkins, was doing uh, her master's degree with uh, Tom Swetnam at the tree ring lab at the University of Arizona. And she was up working in the white bark pine forests, trying to get chronology uh, for these trees. And she, uh, during her work, uh, noticed that during the 1930s, there was a major mortality event in white bark pine. And she was thinking, well, perhaps this was due to mountain pine beetle, but she wasn't sure. Uh, she gave Jean a call and said, you think you'd be interested in coming up uh, to take a look at some of my white bark pine sites and see if perhaps you can identify if mountain pine beetle was really responsible. So Jean and I came up here. We went with Dana into Sam Pass, one of her uh, sites in the, in the sawtooth. And even from these trees that have been killed in the 1930s, at that time 50 years uh, prior to the time we were up there, he was able to chip away the bark and as the beetle attacks the tree, it leaves this very uh, distinctive gallery. And he was saying, yeah, these trees were killed in the 1930s by the mountain pine beetle. So that was uh, really an interesting turn of events. And here I had this uh, model at our disposal that we had been working on for quite some time. Barbara had been validating it. We had a lot of confidence in this, in this predictive model of the mountain pine beetle. And the important thing is this coincidence of emergence because, uh, you know, it takes literally thousands or tens of thousands or millions of flying beetles uh, to successfully kill trees. And it's really important that they all emerge at the same time. And this is com a completely temperature-driven event, and that's what our model was used to predict. And uh, at that time, the thought was, you know, it's very, uh, that mountain pine beetle essentially wasn't a, a pest or didn't occur in white bark pine. And uh, here was this mortality event from the 1930s, and there had been some uh, observations elsewhere of significant mortality occurring in white bark pine. And that was, uh, that was an interesting scientific question to me. And uh, looking back at the temperature records, the 1930s, in the, particularly the early part of that decade, were the hottest on record. There were a couple of years. At that, uh, at that time, 1933 was the hottest year on record. So there was an input of uh, high temperatures. And in 1990, the IPCC, uh, first IPCC uh, report came out on climate change. So we had a report with predictions of what climate change might bring about as far as temperatures had a validated model to plug these predictions into, and I did with the with the uh, with the predictions that uh, the IPCC, the International, uh, you know, the United Nations uh, panel on climate change, uh, with the predictions that they were making back in 1990, 30 years ago. Uh, plugged into my model and said, wow, you know, things could really start to happen, both predicted by our model and what we had observed in the 1930s. This is really an interesting scientific question. And besides, I really like being up in the white bark. So, uh, made a commitment uh, being project leader. I had some resources at, at hand and put up uh, uh, weather station say let's let's follow this let's see what happens and our first uh, weather station was I think in 90 uh, 94 up on Galena summit and it was state-of-the-art we wired uh, things up there and uh, we got a year of uh, recording um, you know checked out the uh, the instruments and things worked well 
But Galena Summit wasn't the, the best site. You know, it's a nice white bark pine site. There, it's a nice forest up there, but there's already a snow tail site that is measuring temperature. Plus, our weather station was observable as the road started up, uh, as you start up the road at Galena Summit. And the uh, <coughs> SNRA wasn't particularly over, overjoyed to having this weather station obvious. And, uh, so anyhow, again working with Dana, one of her other sites was over in the White Clouds, a place called Railroad Ridge. And for the, the locals in particular, if you've not been up there, you should. It's a remarkable place. Uh, this big wide ridge, uh, 10,000 feet in elevation. And at that time, which would be 1995, I guess, the uh, white bark forest up there was gorgeous. This massive, beautiful canopy of white bark. And it, white bark's an interesting tree for a pine tree. This, the canopy of white bark is widespread. It's not like lodgepole pine or subalpine fir. It's more, if you look at it from the air, it looks more like a deciduous forest. The uh, canopy of white bark is, I think, five or six times that of the average lodgepole. So it's, it's shaded underneath and open. I mean, these forests are just magical. And Railroad Ridge was a magical place, you know. And uh, when we got up there to set up, uh, so I invested, you know, a fair amount of money from the project in four state-of-the-art weather stations. And we were uh, putting thermocouples right in the floam temperature, the habitat of, of where the beetle lived, made their living. And we uh, would start at the crown and go up about 10 or 12 feet above snow depth and get uh, year-round temperature measurements. And, and so we were really, uh, well set up. We had four sites, four different aspects up on Railroad Ridge, and within each site we had the trees wired with these thermocouples in the cardinal direction. So we are getting a lot of data, had made a fair investment, and in fact at that time I got called on the carpet back to the Washington office. Uh, the fellow that was in charge of the then uh, forest insect and disease research was a guy by the name of Jane, uh, James Stewart and Jim asked me, he said, here you've spent all this money studying an insect that doesn't occur, occur in an ecosystem that's really not important. And uh, I, you know, I didn't have a really good response to that. Uh, I said, well, you know, we've got some modeling work that indicates there may be a problem up in these high elevation forests, and they do matter. You know, they're ecologically really important. And one of the things I was trying to do as project leader was sort of shift the, the project away from pure economic interest, although that's always uh, of interest, to more uh, an ecological uh, basis. And I said these forests are tremendously important ecologically, and I think it's worth the investment. And I'm not sure I convinced him, but the money was spent. There was nothing they could do, you know. So for the next uh, several years, a, a fellow who is really important in this story, a guy by the name of Jim Vandegriff, who was a technician on the uh, Bark Beetle Project, and I would come up here. You know, we weren't spending a lot of time on Railroad Ridge, but we'd come up typically sometime in the summer. Uh, Jim would... Uh, do the maintenance on the weather stations. We'd look around and uh, kind of get a, try and get an, a, a feel for what was going on ecologically and spend a couple of days up in this beautiful forest. And at that time, you could not find a red tree. It was this solid mass of white bark pine, green white bark pine trees. And uh, I'd usually get up there once in winter uh, you had to get up in winter to see what was going on, of course. And uh, do a little ski touring, coincidentally, because that's also necessary when you're, when you're out. So we were, you know, we weren't spending a lot of time, but we were paying attention. And uh, one of the major questions uh, that was in our mind was, you know, does, are these forests really uh, absent of a, a mountain pine beetle? And what Jim found was if, one of the, the characteristics of white bark pine uh, 
is uh, the relationship with the Clark's Nutcracker. They're almost entirely dependent on Nutcracker caches for reproduction. So a Nutcracker cache will have several seeds. Uh, the Nutcracker's cache, maybe a thousand caches. And remember the exact location of each one, pretty amazing in itself. But the, uh, the trees uh, tend to sprout and there'll be a cluster. And as the center trees get large, they force the, out, the uh, outside trees more and more horizontally, and they're subject to eventually loading with snow and falling to the ground. And Jim found every, every tree that had been thrown to the ground, protected in winter by snow, had mountain pine beetle larvae. But it took several years at historical temperatures to complete the life cycle. And the real danger was with climate warming, they would start to assume this uh, univolting one a complete life cycle in one year and coincident emergence. But Jim found this population that was up there. So we were going up there uh, on an annual basis, a couple of times a year from 1995 for the next seven or eight years until in 2003 and the road up to Railroad Ridge, an old mining road, it's pretty rough and not maintained and you know so it's kind of a grind getting up there uh, but in 2003 as we crested the top of the ridge here in this previous beautiful white bark pine forest where there had been no beetle uh, activity other than this uh, very suppressed population living on uh, essentially as a, a saprophage on uh, on these trees that have been thrown down on the ground by snow we start we saw a few red trees so uh oh and our modeling prediction our weather at that time the habitat was becoming increasingly favorable for the mountain pine beetle so 2003, we saw the first beetles, 2004, uh, these point uh, beetle infestations had started to coalesce. In 2005, uh, there were large areas that had been killed by mountain pine beetle. And it, it was really startling to us, even though we were familiar with uh, the mountain pine beetle in lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine forest, just how fast this occurred. It, uh, from 2003, in three years, it looked like the forest was uh, headed towards, uh, you know, uh, complete, completely falling apart. Uh, and we hypothesized either uh, white bark pine was an exceptionally good food resource for the beetle, or it lacked in tree defenses. And I had another graduate student working for me at the time, uh, that uh, Donovan Gross, who determined that no, mountain pine beetle can do perfectly well in white bark, but it's no better, no worse. It really depends on flown thickness. So that left, they're probably not well defended. And that uh, eventually uh, became uh, the story. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really a pretty startling sort of event. It happened very quickly. And uh, then I retired. 2006, I retired from the Forest Service. Uh, things were going on politically with the George uh, W. Bush administration that just uh, didn't seem to uh, fit well for somebody trying to do research. And I, uh, at the time, had the option, uh, which I exercised, and moved up to the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And uh, so in 2006, I moved up there, and again, looking up at the highest elevation, uh, it was obvious these red trees were everywhere. And the white bark pine forest in the greater Yellowstone are maybe some of the most spectacular and widespread uh, in the entire distribution of white bark pine. These forests are really gorgeous anywhere in this ecosystem, extending all the way from the southern winds up to the Absarokas where we are. Uh, at elevations above about 8,500 feet, you're in uh, climax white bark pine forest. And I would make the case, although I, I would hate uh, to have to, to demonstrate it, that these forests, 
in, uh, in, uh, in total are perhaps the last, uh, are the largest uh, old growth forest on the continent. Whitebark pine, because of where it is, and it's an extremely slow growing tree, has never been economically important. So it's uh, never been, uh, these forests have never been cut. They're in much the same state as the time uh, Lewis and Clark first set eyes on these forests, but they were starting to fall apart as well in 2006. And whitebark pine, as I mentioned, is really an important tree ecologically, as I mentioned it to uh, James uh, Stewart back in Washington years uh, before. Uh, this wide canopy uh, really is important in protecting snow uh, and, and, and in uh, particular in spring as the snow melts, most snow, uh, most water in the west really comes uh, from snow melt and it's important that uh, this reservoir is gradually released and white bark, the, the shade of white bark really protects the winter snow so it's gradually released in the spring. It's an important food resource for uh, the seeds of white bark pine are like they're very large, they're pinon size, and white bark pine is uh, one of uh, uh, five species worldwide that are known as the stone pines, and the stone pines are unique in that their cones remain closed. They never open to release the seeds, they have to be uh, ripped apart, and the thing that rips them apart is a crow-like bird. In the case of white bark, it's Clark's nutcracker. So the uh, nutcracker has to rip apart the cones, plants the seeds in these caches that it uses for food throughout the year, and plants new forests. It's this wonderful relationship between the corvid, uh, the bird, and the, and the tree. Uh, but white uh, Clark's nutcracker isn't the only animal. They're really an important food resource for rodents like the red squirrels. And uh, what's important, particularly up in the greater Yellowstone, and would be here too if they were here, is that grizzly bears, uh, at that time, uh, white bark pine was the most important food resource for grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem because they raid the squirrel caches. So the squirrels do all the work. If you get up in the fall in a white bark pine forest with good crone crop, you'll just be bombarded with squir uh, cones. The red squirrels are up in the canopy. The uh, cones tend to be up in the top of the trees. And they just uh, cut uh, large numbers of cones, drop them to the ground. Then they come down, collect them up all in one place, uh, midden. And uh, the grizzly comes along and says, hmm, there's all these cones. They just feast. And a red squirrel is absolutely no threat to a grizzly bear. So they're, uh, they, you know, they're really important in, the, in grizzly habitat. And when we got uh, to the greater Yellowstone, looked up uh, lots and lots of red trees, things are happening there at the same sort of uh, scale and extent that they're happening here in, at Railroad Ridge. And in 2007, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, decided that uh, the threatened and endangered uh, Yellowstone grizzlies had recovered and they removed them from the uh, threatened and endangered list. And in their document, uh, they made the statement that 16% of the white bark pine in the greater Yellowstone had been impacted at some level by the mountain pine beetle. And just looking up in those forests, uh, I didn't know how much had been impacted, but I knew 16% was way off. And uh, the, the uh, data, the scientific data that was based on was really flawed. So I worked with uh, Earth Justice, a guy by the name of Doug Honnold, uh, prepared uh, a deposition uh, that, uh, that Doug used to challenge in court the delisting, and uh, the Fish and Wildlife was reversed. Uh, the grizzly was uh, put back on the endangered species list. Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, challenged that in the uh, District of Court of Appeals, and the appeals court upheld the lower court uh, based on the inadequate treatment 
of the loss of white bark pine. So this is, uh, you know, ecologically it's an important deal. It's an important deal for the uh, grizzly. Uh, two uh, years ago, Fish and Wildlife once again attempted to list the delist the grizzly. Once again, they were challenged, and one of the main things that had happened in the in the approximately 10 years since the uh, the delisting that I was involved with is the tribes uh, became involved in this whole issue. A coalition of uh, U.S. and Canadian tribes signed a treaty to approximately I think, well over a hundred tribes uh, saying that this bear is really an important uh, to us for religious, spiritual reasons and uh, the idea of a uh, you know, uh, trophy hunting this animal is just repulsive to us. So they entered into the challenge with a very strong voice. Once again, the, the uh, Fish and Wildlife was avert, reversed. Once again, they appealed, and once again, the appeals court held up uh, the lower court. So it's really an unfortunate situation, uh, a merry-go-round of delisting, challenging court appeals, and all this, you know, a tremendous... Uh, amount of resources, money, effort that could be spent on the true uh, recovery of this uh, animal in the greater Yellowstone. Uh, there are issues uh, with connectivity, uh, genetic exchange, you know, that can be addressed and should be addressed, but, uh, uh, and perhaps uh, it will. But, this leads us to where we are now with, uh, with what's the future hold for these magnificent white bark pine forests. And, uh, you know, they're already uh, at the top of the mountains, uh, the highest forests, but there are, you know, tree line and above tree line, uh, Crumholtz, this shrubby uh, growth of uh, growth form of white bark pine. Uh, exists. So where white bark pine exists today, the forests that the white bark pine uh, forests of today are probably not the white bark pine forest uh, of the future. It's above them in the remaining, uh, you know, at tree line or above. And uh, there are areas of refugia like the Wind River Mountains and up in the Beartooth Plateau that are going to be remain cold for quite some time, and the white bark will do well there. So, you know, there uh, it, it's an interesting situation. The models, uh, other models since my retirement, are predicting pretty much the loss of the current habitat. Uh, so it seems like the restoration efforts should be focused on these places where white bark, you know, has a future. And it would be tragic, you know, to truly lose these forests from the landscape. Uh, but there are efforts being made. Uh, another thing that uh, an issue with white bark pine is an introduced uh, disease, white pine blister rust. And the Forest Service has worked hard to find, uh, grow in, uh, you know, resistant strains of uh, blister rust trees and are now planting these uh, blister rust resistant trees. They like you, Jesse. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the strategy should be to use these the expensive trees that takes a lot to produce these trees. A lot of investment has been made in places that have a future for white bark. And uh, I think with that, I'll open it up to comments or questions. I know we have some people here in the audience that are really familiar with white bark and really familiar with the history here. And in fact, I'd ask, I'll, I'll throw a question to Ed. I've not been up on Railroad Ridge since 2005. What, uh, what has eventually happened there? Um, you know, I'd be hard pressed to come up with a mortality uh, estimate, but we still have a we still have a fair number of green trees, um, but probably fifty percent dead anyway. Fifty percent? What percent of the uh, so Ed says like fifty percent of the white bark up on Railroad uh, Ridge were uh, killed in this event? Uh, 
uh, how, how much of the comb producing trees like what and the, the tree has to be a certain size to have a certain flown thickness to support the beetle so they'll they tend to attack the oldest uh, trees they you know the larger trees first work down until they get to trees that are small enough that simply won't support them and then the infestation dies out probably a similar number Jesse of the big mature stand mm-hmm so yeah. similar number he said yeah and then uh, what was your uh, statement up on Yeah. How, how, how old of a tree before they start actually producing cones? Well, so the question is, how long does a tree, how old does a tree, a uh, white bark pine, before it starts producing cones? And I'd contrast this to uh, lodgepole pine, they'll start producing cones in 10 years. White bark is a really slow growing tree. One of the uh, interesting, uh, slow growing and long lived, one of the interesting things about Railroad Ridge is Dana uh, documented the oldest white bark pine uh, known at the time, perhaps still is, at about 12, 1,200 years old if I remember. And I think I've seen trees that are probably much older than that. They live for a long time and they, uh, as they grow old, they don't, <laughs> unlike some of us, their reproductive capacity does not decrease. You know, their cones are just as viable at 900 years as they are at 50 years. But it takes about 50 years in the greater Yellowstone before the trees start producing cones. So there's, uh, as you know, in some of the forests, some of the mortality in places in Yellowstone of cone-bearing trees reach 90, over 90%. So uh, even though there are small trees in the understory, that resource for grizzlies is essentially lost for a half a century, pretty close to it. So uh, you know, they're, they're slow going, they're amazing at surviving. They survive in these harshest climates on the continent, but they're not very good at competition. So as climate warms and these uh, becomes more favorable for other trees, spruce fir in particular, the, uh, they'll move, uh, the projections are they'll move up in uh, elevation and uh, white bark will be out competed. Uh, like I say, they're great survivors, they're not much at competition. Jesse, to your right, there's a question to your right. Oh, sorry, yes. Are there any other areas besides Railroad Ridge in this ecosystem where there are white bark pines? Every, every place in this ecosystem, uh, like I said, in the greater Yellowstone that I'm uh, most familiar with now, above 8,500 feet or so, you get into Climax white bark pine forests. The same is true here. It's a little uh, more of an arid ecosystem, so maybe it's a little bit lower. But I would say any, any place you get up, uh, you know, near the Alpine, you're going to find probably climax white bark pine forests. So the, all, the, all the high ridges, if you get out your uh, binoculars, uh, typically, as I mentioned, the valley floor will be lodgepole, then there'll be a band of spruce fir, and then above that, you start to see these very characteristic tree forms, this broad canopy of the white bark pine forests. So every, everywhere at a high elevation where other trees can't make a living, in this ecosystem, you'll find white bark pine and gorgeous white bark pine. As I mentioned, the oldest tree on records over on Railroad Ridge. Uh, yeah. Jesse, did you, in your experience, or did you hear from Dana uh, in her observations, see much impact from Mr. Russ over here? Well, you know. Uh, what was that question? The, the question was the impact of blister rust. I, I unfortunately really uh, can't speak to that in this ecosystem because I really wasn't tuned in to blister rust at that time. And maybe you can, or Jim could address that, but uh, in the greater Yellowstone, which is perhaps a little more mesic, a little more moisture than this system, and blister rust has a complete, uh, has a complex life cycle uh, and it, requires, uh, it does a lot better in more moist systems. Uh, 
In the greater Yellowstone, uh, at the present time, the rate of blister rust infection is about 20%. And, uh, you know, the, it's been uh, slow to get there. And blister rust, uh, as opposed to mountain pine beetle, which kills the tree immediately, blister rust may take 10 years. And uh, the tree can uh, block, can recover from a, a blister rust infection too. But, uh, you know, my guess is it's here. I, uh, it's a pretty arid system here, pretty dry. Uh, probably not quite uh, doing quite as well as in Yellowstone, but Jesse. I don't know. Do you have a... Yeah, I've, I've seen some evidence of it here, but nothing like in the GYE, like on Avalanche Peak in the southeast corner of Yellowstone. That is that, yeah, Avalanche Peak's almost entirely mountain pine beetle. And, uh, you know, the... Like I say, it's about 20% uh, in the greater Yellowstone of, bliss, of blister rust. The blister rust just kind of, mountain pine beetle, there was, uh, it was interesting, as I, I mentioned it, that at the time we moved there in 2006, things were really starting to fall apart. By 2009, it was widespread. This place you mentioned, Avalanche Peak, pro I would guess 94%. Uh, mortality of the of the cone bearing trees there are very few cone bearing trees there uh, su surviving but in 2009 uh, kind of at the peak uh, of red trees just a blanket of, of red trees in that ecosystem uh, there was an early cold event the fall of 2009 where in October uh, temperatures got down in the high country across the ecosystem of uh, minus 20, minus 30 degree temperatures. And that's before the beetle larvae have a chance to produce their antifreezes. The, uh, the beetle uh, produces an antifreeze compound that switches from growth uh, to produce these antifreeze compounds, but metabolically that's quite expensive. So they, they don't do it before they have to, you know, in ecological terms. So it takes some time. In the middle of the winter, they'll take temperatures down to minus 40 degrees. Centigrade or Fahrenheit, it happens at 40 degrees. Uh, but when they're uh, developing this uh, antifreeze compound, or in the spring when they're starting to re-metabolize it, they become quite vulnerable. So this 2009 event essentially shut the, shut the outbreak down. Because there's a lack of food in a lot of places, you know, there's, the outbreak, uh, it, it's not active at the present time, but as trees mature, as temperatures warm, anticipate it's just going to be this re, uh, reoccurring roller coaster of outbreaks and at the same time other conifers moving up into the current white bark pine habitat. So that's what, you know, the prediction would be. Jesse, did you just say... We got a oh, sorry. question in back. Uh, yes. Uh, is it possible for a spruce and fir to uh, replace the cone-bearing trees that are dying because of the blister rust? Is that possible? Yeah, I'm really uh, hard of hearing. And it's without a microphone, I, can't, I really didn't catch that. Jesse, is it possible? Oh, okay. Uh, is it possible for spruce fir or other conifers to replace the role of white bark? And uh, in some uh, respects, sure, as far as protection of uh, uh, water resources. But remember that seed of white bark pine is uh, this large, highly nutritious seed that's so important for a lot of animals, Clark's nutcracker, uh, red squirrels, and grizzlies, to name three, that that's not going to be replaced. Uh, and, uh, you know, I say, yeah, as far as the watershed function, it's true that uh, other conifers protect it, but not to the extent of white bark. As I mentioned, white bark has these huge protective canopy. It's really sh shaded underneath. Uh, white bark forest. And if you go up in the spring, uh, up in the mountains, up in the sawtooth here, and you look at, at ribbons of white bark versus exposed areas, 
you'll see the exposed areas will be clear and there'll still be snow in the white bark. Anybody that does spring touring here knows just how effective white bark is at protecting the uh, water resource. So in some res uh, respects, yes, but not really to replace this long-term evolved role that mountain pine, that white bark pine uh, plays in these high elevation systems. Yes. Oh, uh, first. <laughs> Yes, and uh, you know Jim Reinhold here is uh, with much better uh, to uh, prepare to answer that question, and the effectiveness uh, is kind of uh, hit or miss. It seems like under certain conditions, under the right circumstances, yes. And working with Jim, we did some pretty interesting work here. One of the main economic. Uh, uh, importance of the lodgepole forest was fuel wood over in Ketchum and so we were using there's not only uh, verbenone which repels beetles but there are pheromones that attract beetles and we were trying to push beetles out of areas that were hard to get to and there were all these volunteer roads being put in to collect firewood and use attractive uh, attracting pheromones to pull them in uh, to certain areas, and uh, Jim was uh, an important part of that work. And Jim, would you like to speak to the the question? Great. Well, thanks, Jim. Thanks, uh, thanks for the comment also for your work, you, you know, in the area. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse, can you clarify something? We got another question over here. Just okay. get to you. Yeah. yeah, so the question is, what, why the growth form of the white bark? Why these beautiful white canopies? And there's, there, you know, I'm not a qualified evolutionary ecologist, but have some ideas. You know, the reproductive strategy is uh, from a neglected Clark's nutcracker. So when you go up into the white bark pine forest and you see a typical white bark pine, you know, right close to the ground, it'll branch out into several. Those are actually individual trees, and they've grown together at the at the crown. So part of that growth form comes from the fact that it's a, a cache. There are several seeds that are planted and grow together, so it, it forces the outer trees as they get, grow large. And there's this, there is competition within their clone mates, so it's advantageous to have this wide, canopy and also the cones of white bark uh, are, are typically right on the top on the on the terminal uh, tips you know they're there's like they're sitting up there saying okay nutcrackers come in and collect my seeds and go plant my forest you know and the nutcrackers typically will come in they'll swoop up and go boom right down on top of the tree and in this in the fall you'll see in a uh, see them up right on the top obviously filling their uh, seed pouches with uh, seeds. So I think it's a competition uh, within the clone, this fact that there are several trees that are forcing one another out. So you get, you know, what we look at is one tree is really a collection of three to five trees maybe uh, that are making a living all together. <laughs> 
So that's kind of my way I'd answer it. Back to the delisting, uh, back and forth, you know, with uh, lawsuits and science and all that kind of stuff. I heard you say that the Forest Service said only 16% of the greater Yellowstone was affected by the mountain pine beetle. But then your research, when well, you... Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a point. It wasn't the Forest Service. It was uh, Fish and Wildlife. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and that was... Uh, but the the data was based on the annual uh, uh, flawed in the interpretation of Forest Service data by Fish and Wildlife. A couple of years after uh, the, well, it was actually the summer of 2009, um, Wally McFarlane, a, a geographer from Utah State University, uh, and I put together a project to fly the Greater Yellowstone to see, uh, you know, really what the situation uh, was. And it, as it turns out, uh, rather than 16 percent, uh, 50 percent had been impacted to a level to essentially foreclose the ecological services that were provided by white bark pine. Another 30% had been seriously impacted, and altogether about, rather than 16%, about 90% of the white bark pine in the Greater Yellowstone had been impacted by some level. That's not saying 90% loss, but 90% of the stands had been impacted. And the loss of white bark cone-bearing trees in that ecosystem is probably uh, with a combination of the 88 fire, uh, mountain pine beetle, and white pine blister rust, it's probably somewhere in the low 80% loss. So it's it's a ecologically a catastrophe, really. Thank you. So thanks a lot for oh. Just just a point of fact, you mentioned that Dana documented the oldest known white bark in the white clouds. We also had the largest known white bark in the sawtooth, so our white barks are rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Rock stars of the rock stars. That's pretty cool. And, you know, I, I, I guess I don't find that super surprising. As I mentioned, this is a pretty harsh habitat. And where you find those old trees tend to be in the toughest places. As I mentioned, they're great at surviving. They just hang in there century after century after century. But they're not much at competition, so in these really tough sites, other trees can't make a living and white bark just hangs out. So I am not surprised to hear that. I've got to get you up into some places in the winds, however. And maybe you've, you've seen some of the forests up there, with their whole forest of these ancient trees. So, yeah, they're rock stars everywhere, but here is, uh, is pretty cool. Every white bark mine is rock stars. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, good. Thanks a lot for your attention. I've enjoyed it. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, and thank you very much, Jesse, for all of that information. For anyone who hasn't been up onto Railroad Bridge, it's worth the trek. Um, getting up there somehow, some way. Uh, so next week for our forum and lecture series, we have a, another presentation related to the earthquakes that we've all been experiencing. Um, Glenn Thackeray from Idaho State University will be here speaking about the Sawtooth Fault. He, uh, his work helped discover the Sawtooth Fault, and so he'll be able to tell us about um, the Sawtooth Fault itself and the fact that these earthquakes are connected to it. At first, they didn't think that was true. Um, we also have some programs going on in the next couple days. We have some evening programs happening at the Redfish Visitor Center Amphitheater at 7 p.m. Um, tomorrow. And right now I'm blanking on what it is, but I think it is on fire ecology, if I'm remembering correctly. And then on Sunday, right here from 1 to 3 p.m., we are hosting History Day um, in lieu of our typical ice cream social. So if you're interested, please join us for some uh, mule packing demonstrations. We're going to have cross-cut saw demonstrations. We'll have a little quilting display set up and a wall tent and some kids' activities. So if you have anyone who you think might be interested, please join us. And uh, for now, I think that is all. Thank you so much, Jesse, um, and everyone have a good evening.